Today we're going to explore some of the evidence that suggests that schizophrenia is not a single unitary disease state. Rather, we're going to explore evidence that suggests that what we call schizophrenia, without an S, is actually comprised of several distinct underlying diseases that have similar enough behavioral symptoms that they go by the same name. This idea is not really new or revolutionary. The notion that schizophrenia is not a single disease, but instead is comprised of several diseases, is a very old idea, and it was actually first proposed by the man who gave us the name schizophrenia, Eugene Bloiler. In his original writings about the disease that he himself named, Bloiler was very clear that he felt that schizophrenia was comprised of multiple diseases or a family of diseases. He called it the group of schizophrenias in some of his writings. Um, however, as much as he liked the, the name schizophrenia, he found it difficult to use the word in the plural form in his writing and his conversation. So he was, he wrote that um, he means multiple diseases, but he's going to say schizophrenia um, without the S for the sake of convenience. And actually, if we consider the intellectual heritage or the conceptual pedigree for the definition of schizophrenia that we use today, we can see very clearly that this is a chimera concept. You, uh, we have taken the notions of Emil Kreppelin, who was informed by the theories of neurodegeneration and by germ theory, um, thinking that there was a single causative agent uh, that led to a progressive and deteriorating illness course. And we see the Kreplin ideas are blended with Bloiler's ideas, uh, which are psychodynamically informed and uh, involve a central process in Bloiler's view that involve the, the separation or the splitting of various mental faculties. So these are two very distinctly different concepts of illness, um, yet they are combined in the modern definition of schizophrenia without an S. Let's imagine that schizophrenia were recognized as of today or within the last 10 years. We might go about trying to understand its cause by uh, collecting very large samples of affected people and looking at lots of genes and lots of symptoms and then using big data approaches to try to identify naturally occurring clusters. Uh, this approach, th this modern approach, has been applied to schizophrenia and it has resulted in the, in the identification of 17 independent, which is to say non-interactive, um, sets of genetic and biochemical distortions. So you could argue, based upon these data, that what we call schizophrenia is comprised of 17 different genetic and biochemical entities. Um, these investigators also looked at detailed uh, behavioral symptoms and looking for pattern recognition um, came up with the notion that there would be eight distinct behavioral syndromes within the schizophrenias. A different modern approach to the categorization of schizophrenia-like illness would be to simply use electroencephalography and uh, quantify the waveforms. And in doing this, John and colleagues have discerned six different electrophysiological signatures within groups of people with schizophrenia. An interesting extension of this work is that John and colleagues found that these six electrophysiological subtypes that were recognized within the schizophrenia samples uh, also existed in other forms of illness characterized by psychotic states, such as psychotic depression or alcohol withdrawal psychosis. So this is another piece of data suggesting that what we call schizophrenia is not the same disease for everybody. If we take a big step backward in time to the pre-pharmacology era, uh, divergent clinical courses amongst patients with schizophrenia were suggesting the possibility that different disease states were underlying the behavioral syndrome. In fact, Kreplin himself, using his criteria for dementia precox, found that about 13% of the patients he diagnosed eventually um, underwent spontaneous recovery. And a larger 
and more comprehensive study was um, initiated by the son of Eugene Bloiler. Uh, his son was named Manfred. Manfred Bloiler uh, followed a cohort of individuals who were diagnosed in the years 1942 or 1943, and Bloiler found that a substantial number of the patients were able to mount full recoveries. Another portion got significantly better but didn't seem to recover fully, and a third portion of individuals seemed to have a persistent illness that kept them hospital bound. Similar divergent clinical courses have been found in the modern post-pharmacology era, and more recently, um, in first episode psychosis patients, it's been discovered that about 20% of individuals after stabilization from a first episode of schizophrenia are able to maintain long-term remission without any antipsychotic medications. About 30% of that cohort requires some antipsychotic medications, but the doses that are sufficient to maintain remission are significantly lower than the other group which required higher doses doses of conventional um, antipsychotic medications and or clozapine. So a clinical course tells us that there could be several different illnesses um, at play under the schizophrenia diagnosis. Although divergent clinical course is consistent with the presence of multiple diseases within schizophrenia, it's far from conclusive. Uh, a valid alternative interpretation of the clinical course data would be that the ones who recover simply have a more mild form of illness, yet the same illness um, at its root as the ones who had more difficult or more persistent courses of illness. So if we want to answer the fundamental question, are all schizophrenia the same or are there different diseases within a behavioral symptom syndrome? Uh, we could turn to medications and medication responses to help answer the question. In situations where underlying pathophysiology is unknown, drugs can actually function as touchstones to physiological reality. Uh, the response of a physiological system to the presence of drug uh, actually tells you a lot about the mechanisms of the underlying symptom. So a patient that responds, a patient who has fever and cough who responds to a course of penicillin um, has probably a fundamentally different cause of those symptoms compared to someone with fever and cough who doesn't respond to penicillin. The interpretation would be that the former had gram-positive bacterial infection and the latter didn't, didn't have that, perhaps they have viral infection. So drug response can give you deeper insights into the underlying pathology. So with this as our frame for understanding the nature of schizophrenia, we can now look to variable patterns of drug response and posit that there are four pharmacological subtypes, or what I call pharmacotypes, of schizophrenia. The first type would be a kind which enjoys a rapid and, re rapid and robust therapeutic response to dopamine receptor D2 antagonists. Um, the second type um, enjoys a robust response to these medications, but the time frame for therapeutic response unfolds over the course of months rather than over the course of weeks. A third pharmacotype of schizophrenia is the type that doesn't respond to non-clozapine antipsychotic drugs, but that does therapeutically respond to clozapine. And the fourth pharmacotype would be the kind that responds that doesn't respond to non-clozapine antipsychotic drugs and does not respond to clozapine. And in fact, Dennis Garver and colleagues from University of Louisville um, used the pharmacotype concept and with that were able to match pharmacotypes to biological markers. So in the type 1, the rapid robust responders, uh, these patients had evidence of increased dopamine metabolites in their blood. This was the dopamine, the high dopamine subgroup of illness. In type 2, the slow but robust responders, uh, and in type 3, the non-responders, dopamine levels were normal. In type 2, the slow responders had biomarkers of inflammation, um, and in type 3, the non-responders to non-clozapine antipsychotic drugs, there was no signal for elevated dopamine, and the markers of inflammation that were characterizing type 2 were absent in type 3.
a very simple yet scientifically very viable classification scheme would um, parse the schizophrenias into type A and type B. Type A is probably more easily but just as accurately known as the hyperdopaminergic type or the high dopamine subtype of disease whereas type B is characterized by normal dopamine levels. The next several slides will show you the biochemical data to support this division. Homovanillic acid, or HVA, is a metabolite of dopamine, and under the right and relatively stringent measurement conditions, plasma HVA levels, or cerebrospinal fluid HVA levels, can be valid biomarkers of central dopamine turnover. Atong and Garver showed that HVA levels have a bimodal distribution in the plasma of people with schizophrenia, such that there are two, two, two subtypes. The subtype with high HVA levels, the ones that would by inference have high dopamine turnover, turned out to be responders to non-clozapine antipsychotic drugs, whereas the population which had normal HVA levels turned out not to be responsive to antipsychotic medications. Tyrosine hydroxylase is an enzyme involved in the synthesis of dopamine. Tyrosine hydroxylase is located in the synapses of dopaminergic neurons, and tyrosine hydroxylase immunoreactivity is a histological marker for dopamine synaptic density. Here we look at data from Roberts and colleagues which show dopamine synaptic density in a group of control of healthy control individuals represented by the green bar and in a group of treatment responsive patients with schizophrenia the dark blue bar which you see is substantially elevated indicating that treatment responsive patients have a high dopamine disease state whereas in the light blue bar the patients with the treatment resistant illness had lower levels of dopamine synapse density. So these data are again consistent with the notion of two diseases within schizophrenia, a high, do a high dopamine disease and a low dopamine disease, and these dopaminergic biomarkers are associated with treatment response or treatment non-response to non-clozapine antipsychotics. In the previous slide, we were looking at dopamine synapses, the presynaptic side of the dopamine synapse. Um, in this slide, we're looking at the postsynaptic side, and this biomarker is dopamine D2 receptor density. The top panel of this graph shows the D2 receptor density for a healthy control group, whereas the bottom panel of this graph shows two peaks, which is a signature of bimodal distribution of dopamine D2 receptor density amongst people with schizophrenia. The left peak, you see there is the same distribution in the schizophrenia group as in the control group. Um, the peak to the right uh, on the lower panel shows the, a subpopulation within patients with schizophrenia who have elevated density of D2 receptors, uh, D2 receptors in their postsynaptic sites. Uh, the other thing to comment about this graph is that you see shaded rectangles and open rectangles. Uh, these correspond to people who had been taking antipsychotic medication and who had not been medicated, and you can see that there's really no relationship between dopamine D2 density and medication status, and this suggests that this bimodal distribution of dopamine D2 receptors is not an artifact of treatment status. And again, that this bimodal distribution of dopamine receptors is consistent with the idea that there is a high dopamine disease, so-called type A, and a normal dopamine disease, type B, within schizophrenia. So up to this point, we've seen data looking at dopamine metabolite levels, dopamine presynaptic density, and dopamine D2 receptor density, and all of them show bimodal distribution or suggestive of two populations within schizophrenia that are defined based upon dopamine. Um, in more modern era, we're able to look at dopamine synthesis capacity in vivo using PET scan technique. 
and here we're looking at the results from one of these PET scan evaluations of dopamine synthetic capacity. The light green bar shows the dopamine synthetic capacity of healthy control sample. The dark blue bar shows that amongst treatment responsive individuals with schizophrenia, there is a significantly elevated dopamine synthetic capacity in the brain, again suggestive of the type A or the hyperdopaminergic illness. Um, however, in the light blue bar, we see the dopamine synthetic capacity of treatment non-responders, and we find that in the treatment non-responsive group, that dopamine synthesis is pretty much on par with people that don't have schizophrenia at all. So this is another example of um, another example suggesting that the type A high dopamine and type B normal dopamine schizophrenia um, is a valid construct that also appears to associate with treatment response status. With these findings in mind, it becomes more plausible that variable clinical course um, may reflect the presence of different underlying diseases amongst people that receive a diagnosis of schizophrenia based only on modern behavioral criteria. Certainly the variable patterns of pharmacological response amongst people with the behavioral diagnosis is more suggestive that beyond the behavioral diagnosis exist several different pathophysiologies. Again, based upon patterns of drug response, we would posit that schizophrenia is comprised of four distinct illnesses. But if we consider both the pattern of drug response as well as biomarkers of dopamine signaling status, then it becomes even more persuasive that within schizophrenia are at least two different diseases, a high dopamine disease, the one that they write about in the textbooks, um, and the one that they make most of the approved antipsychotic medications for, and a type B or normal dopamine disease, um, and the existence of a disease not characterized by excessive dopamine signaling can very well explain the phenomenon of treatment resistance whereby drugs that are designed to attenuate dopamine signal don't work, and the explanation would be that in that cohort of patients there is no elevated signal with which these drugs can interact. It should be noted that within the type B or treatment resistant group, 60% uh, approximately will have a very good therapeutic response to clozapine. So the existence of a type B or normal, normal dopamine schizophrenia uh, certainly is a strong argument for trying clozapine and a strong argument for not recapitulating the um, pharmacodynamic strategies of failed medications that were dopamine receptor blockers. And these data suggest a very strong need for uh, more and better studies to try to understand the underlying pathophysiologies so that we can design um, medications which are easier to use and more tolerable than clozapine, as well as for the potentially large number of other illnesses which are neither type A nor type B. So this should be an area of prioritized research.